Not yet. There it is. Now, good morning, church. It's a joy to be with everyone today as we celebrate this day of worship, and, uh, and the mic has to be on because people on our live stream can't hear if I don't have my mic on. So uh, we welcome everyone who is joining us uh, on uh, our live stream, and so we are so glad that you are here, uh, and we, want you, we encourage you to please take the opportunity to, uh, to, to click the See More button there, and you have the opportunity there to register your attendance, to make your gifts, to see information about our e-news. And, uh, and we want to say to everyone online and uh, who are in the space here with us, we are Wellspring. We are the place where all are welcome, all are accepted, all are loved, and all means all. And uh, it's a joy to, uh, to, to be in worship here together. For our announcements, uh, where you have, uh, hopefully you're getting the information, getting our e-news. That's where details are. I just list a few of the things to watch for. And uh, so uh, in the announcements there, uh, you can, uh, you, you see that uh, the Memorial Day offices are closed tomorrow. Uh, we need uh, help with kids' activity bags, and so if you're willing to do that, uh, you, there's a, the, the way to contact, uh, is it Jessica we're contacting? Uh, maybe Frank? Frank. And so uh, to, uh, to help, with, help get set up on that. Uh, there's an up update on our Green Step program and a uh, link to a video there. And then also uh, Wednesdays at the Well, our summer program for all ages, four and up during the summer. It's an intergenerational experience. So if you're available on Wednesday mornings, it's something really fun for us. And um, then also there's an announcement there uh, concerning our annual conference offering. Very often I talk about our annual conference offering. I come back and say, okay, we're doing this. And I said, we're going to try and do this much. And instead, this year we're just going to do it first. So what we're doing is uh, taking up an, an annual conference offering for new church starts. And uh, so what's happened in this season of disaffiliation, we have uh, a number of areas within our conference that do no, no longer have United Methodist churches, sometimes in entire small communities. There's no United Methodist church. Or even in a geographic area, we have uh, this, uh, this big open gap. And we're seeking to fill that. So we're moving back into that space with, uh, with new church starts, uh, with plants, and doing different ways of doing, uh, a, it's called an oasis project, where we are forming house churches and doing all kinds of things. So, so if you're, uh, it's an opportunity for you to give. So you can put either in the, uh, if you're giving you on Shelby Next or giving online, you can, uh, on the, your gift, you can put uh, the memo there. You can add uh, how, how, what you're giving to the new church start. So uh, that's something that's really important. And I think I neglected to say to everyone in the room, do register your attendance on the blue registration cards and put those in the offering plate. That's important for us as well. So, friends, we have, uh, we have so many good things that are happening in the life of the church. And as we move into summer, there's still lots of activities and things that will be happening in our summer months. So uh, just know that uh, we're excited about where God is leading us in the days ahead. So let's stand and join together in worship.
to worship on your screen. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In, In wisdom, you created, created everything, everything that, that exists. exists. You created all things, great and small. You nourish your creatures and fill us with good things. You send forth your spirit and they are created. You renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. wasn't on the program. <laughs> Would you join me in the congregational prayer? God, whose spirit swept across the empty void and began to create, it was you who formed us along with all other beings and created us to your image. It was you who formed us of the dust and breathed your life into us. By the power of your spirit, you led the children of Israel through the wilderness to the land of promise. It was your spirit that empowered the prophets to speak your truth. It was your spirit that was revealed to us in the person of Jesus. And it is that same Holy Spirit that came powerfully amidst the first followers and gave birth to your church. May the Holy Spirit now come upon us again and again, that we might be the body of Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with your vision and our bodies with your power, that we might transform the world. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We are going to be reading from Acts chapter 2, 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound of the, the crowd, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they said, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we, that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
When I was a child, I had this ongoing conversation with my mom, and it went like this. She would tell me something that was of utmost importance. And it might be something that I needed to do, something that I needed to know. And uh, I would nod my head as she spoke. And then she would look at me and say, did you hear me? And I would say, yes, I heard you. And uh, then she would look at me and she would make sure that I, was, I had eye contact with her. I had to have, we had to have eye contact. And she said, now tell me if you're really listening to what I'm saying and now tell me what that means. Not just parrot it back to me, tell me that you've listened to what I'm saying. And um, sadly, that's a theme that recurs in my life frequently. <laughs> it's, I, I, I end up hearing, I, I hear almost everything. I, I'm this person, I have this, uh, uh, the, I'm, I'm real, well, I was diagnosed with adult attention deficit disorder years ago, <laughs> and it makes perfect sense because I can hear everything going on, but, but still not being paying attention to the person that is actually speaking to me. So listening, moving from hearing to listening, and uh, that's one of the things that as we, as we come to this story of Pentecost, it's uh, about moving from the place of hearing, just hearing something, to the place of deep listening, to where we're really listening and, and understanding. And if you pay attention, what we might discover is that God is speaking to us and through us in a powerful new way. Let's pray. God, you speak to us. And so often we hear you. We we hear what, you, what, what we think you say, or we hear many other sounds all around that, other distractions. So we ask that you calm us and focus us that we might truly listen to what you're saying, that we might listen for understanding, that we might then hear you speaking. So as we speak these words together, O oh God, as we share the, the meditations of our collective heart, we pray that all these will somehow be acceptable in your sight as we listen to you. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, amen. amen. So today, today we celebrate the day of Pentecost, and, uh, which is known also as the birthday of the church. It's something that's important for us. It's uh, a time when we talk about the, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit among that empowers the disciples to do their work. And we celebrate the capacity to speak and hear in tongues other than our own native tongues. This, empower, this powerful uh, uh, sharing of, of, of this miracle of Pentecost, which the miracle of Pentecost is, while there's, it, it gives us a little, it's kind of confusing there, so it's kind of a both and in this, but that the, the disciples are speaking in other tongues, but it's, it's also a, a miracle of translation, that whatever they speak is being heard in the native tongue of the, these other people who are from all these different areas. So um, it's, it's, it's ultimately the capacity to see unity even amidst our diversity and to see where God can lead us. But sadly, we don't always actually listen it's interesting that, that, you know, the, that what they say is we hear them speaking in our own native language. The question is, is when you hear them speaking in your native language, are you listening to them? I mean, it is, um, it, it, it's something that when we talk about the Holy Spirit that comes and creates this holy chaos in our midst, and we wake up kind of going, what's going on here as we experience the power of this spirit coming into the midst? So let's get an image of what's happening in this story. The disciples, as we heard last week, were told to stay in Jerusalem until they had been empowered from on high, when they received the power of this Holy Spirit. 
So they're gathered in one place, and it's, it's, it says it's a house, so it may well be this upper room, this room where they had the Last Supper, where it's very likely that they gathered in Acts 1, whenever they were, uh, whenever after the, the ascension, and they went back and they gathered together in a large room. And uh, then it's, it could be this place where they're still gathered. And that, could, that would be, if that's the case, it's likely in the northern, uh, kind of the northwestern quadrant of Jerusalem. It's an area that, uh, where the Essenes were known to gather. And so it's a lot of interesting history around that space. And uh, they, were, um, they were there waiting. And so they were, and, and it would have been open air. No, the windows wouldn't have been closed. It, it would have been too hot. So they... They had the, the, the windows all would be open. And we're told that there comes from heaven this sound like a rush of a, of a, a violent wind which fills the house. And if you want to understand the Holy Spirit, it starts with an understanding of both wind and breath. And I've talked about this before. I know I've said this frequently. But the Greek word is, uh, for spirit is pneuma. And it's, or, or pneumatas, and it's where we get the word uh, for wind and breath, pneuma. And so when we use the word pneumatic, that's a word where, or pneumonia, it's where it comes from. So this pneuma is understood best when we understand wind and we understand breath. And in John's gospel, it, some may remember, and I've talked about this when we've read this, that in John's gospel, the coming of the Holy Spirit is on the day of resurrection when Jesus breathes on his disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's an important part of that. And then John tells us uh, a different account of this coming of the Holy Spirit. And it's also where in John's gospel, we hear Jesus talking to Nicodemus and saying, the wind blows where it will, Right. So if you really think about where that is, uh, that, that the, the Holy Spirit has to do with breath and has to do with wind. And here in Luke, the author of Luke and Acts, uh, we're told that, uh, that, that the coming of the Holy Spirit is a violent wind. It's a strong wind. It's something that moves us. It's something that doesn't let us just stand still. It doesn't leave well, I started to say it doesn't leave our hair alone, but uh, it, uh, it, it, it changes things for us, right? And, uh, and, and so then we have this, uh, this image of the divided tongues as a fire that appear among them and tongues that, that were resting on each one of them. And it's an interesting image when we think of the tongues as, uh, as, as flames, and here the word for tongues, it's important because we think often of the tongue, but it's the tongues is, is what we, how we often do use the word tongues, plural, that it's uh, the word glosse, glosse, from which we get glossary or glossolalia even in, in about the, the ecstatic utterances in uh, language, in, for, in a divine language. And so... Um, but it's not only about words. Glosse is literally defined as languages. Language, language is appearing as fire and resting on each of us. Stop and think about that. Languages falling all over us. And it's, it's really important. They began to use these tongues, these languages, to speak to everyone around them so they could speak in every possible space to every possible person and that's a powerful image for me and you see you know the, the crowd there is from all over the place they would have been united only by possibly Hebrew but they were gathered there for the Jewish feast day of, of Shavuot and Shavuot is uh, the is the uh, the this uh, feast where it's one of the big feast days that is, uh, is 50 days after the big first day of Passover. And it's when all males were expected or hoped to come worship in the temple and to have an offering there. And it was the beginning of the wheat harvest. So it was, this, uh, the, it was, a, it was a ritual that was praying for God to bless them in the wheat harvest as they gathered in the temple. 
And, um, and, and as I said, they would have been united around Hebrew, possibly. But the gift of Pentecost on that day was the gift of having the word of God spoken to them. This, this gospel message being proclaimed to them, not in a language that they had to learn in Hebrew school or in, 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 as they were growing up, they had to learn that they didn't, most of them didn't speak that in their everyday language. They had another first language, whatever it was. And so this is proclaimed to them in their native tongue, in their first language. And so the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, the people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, all these areas around the Mediterranean, around the modern world of that time, uh, heard something incredible. They heard their own language being spoken to them. And if you've traveled abroad in places where, uh, where another language other than your own, own is predominant, you know the joy of hearing your own language, especially when you don't know the predominant language being spoken. In 2006, I uh, was a chaperone for our daughter's choir trip to uh, Germany and Austria. And so uh, we were all through southern Germany and over into northern part of Austria. And it was, uh, it was a great trip, but uh, it was that, that year they were experiencing a much colder winter that bled over deeper into March. And so uh, I had a jacket that was pretty good against the cold, but there was still, I didn't have anything whenever we were dressing up for the various concerts. I didn't have anything that was a good warm dressier coat. And uh, so it was, and it got even colder as we got into Vienna. And when we got to Vienna, I, uh, uh, I, about three blocks from where, from our hotel, I spotted a store that had a, uh, that, that I saw these coats, these nicer dressy coats in there. And so I went, I, I got everything settled. And then during a break, I took off and went to that store. And when I got to the store, I walked in and as an American who doesn't speak German or any other European language, I, uh, you walk in and you say English, just say it out loud. And, uh, and what I got from all of the people in the store was nine. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just started, uh, I started uh, looking at these jackets. They had some, some wool jackets that were pretty good. And so, and I even still have it and still wear it. But one of the things that happened though, was that during that trip, I weighed at that time, I was at one of my peak, it was my peak weight and I was a little over 300 pounds. So I was, a, I, I was much heavier and very much out of shape. And so uh, I, I went to the lar found the largest jacket and I was kept kind of digging through to see if they had anything larger and the people could see that I was just lost, right? And so one of them finally, they said something to each other in German and then they took off, one, one guy took off to the back and out comes a guy who, who speaks a very little bit of English. And so he's trying to help me find the right jacket and the largest jacket that they have. The largest one they had had buttons that were set about two inches back from the seam. So it was, it was, it fit, but it was like just a real tug. And so I was, I was putting it on and, and I could see him work, searching for words. And he's looking at me intently and he's trying to put something together. And he says, I think... I think, I think you should lose some weight. <laughs> he said it plainly in my language. <laughs> but, you know, so, so many of us are reluctant to use other languages. We get so concerned about how our language has to be the predominant language. And in America, we have a pretty smug attitude about English, don't we? I mean, we, we believe that it should be the universal norm, and it actually is in some ways around the world. But it is something that I think it would behoove us here maybe to learn Spanish. I don't know, you know, and to learn other languages to be able to 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 create something bigger and better and in when i was in europe i discovered uh both times i'd been in central europe that that um that there that many people spoke three sometimes four or more languages so people very much love that and so um 
when we insist that everything conform to our comfort level and to our language, we miss the point of this story in Acts. And that's where I'm going with this. That we miss the point when it has to be about us and our comfort and everybody needing to speak my language. But it's when we are capable of, of, of somehow translating out, of using other languages, of, of seeing this, the, the, the tongues, how the, that tongue being experienced in, uh, their own, in their own language was really a powerful thing. And it was God in that moment using language to move toward the people. Did you notice that? It's not asking them to come toward God. It's God moving ever outward toward the people. And even to the point of saying there is not one language. There is not a holy language. There is the language of the people. And when we begin to learn the language of the people... Then we began to transform our world. And what that means is, is that sometimes we learn the language. It's not the, just the spoken various languages we have, but maybe sometimes we need to learn the language of poverty. Sometimes maybe we need to learn the language of, of, of exclusion. Maybe we need to learn the language of, of those who are, who are marginalized and harmed in our society. And when we learn that language, we can then move toward the people. And we can understand how, how their perspective brings us new perspective. So this growing church is God moving toward the people. The followers of Jesus were empowered not to draw the people to themselves, but rather they were empowered to go outward. It's one of the things that's a problem that the church has experienced throughout its life is we have lived so long with this model that is, we still do, it's known as the attractional model of, of Christianity, which is if you build it, they will come. Or if you call them and you say the right thing, they will come. Or if you make them afraid enough of whatever it is out there and you have the answer in here, they will come. But it's trying to draw people into the church. And so the question has always been, how many more people do we need to go get to come to church? And the question of Pentecost is, how many times do we need to have the wind blow through us to knock us out of this place into the world where, God, where the gospel is made real in you? That's the question. And that's the power of this. But it's risky we don't like to move in a direction where we're prone to think that the people who do such things are, are drunk or on drugs or otherwise delusional because they're people who, who keep moving away from the church out into the world and doing these odd things. If you recall last week, Peter had begun to take his place as a leader among the apostles, and so he was the first to speak. Uh, and what did he say? He said, listen to what I say. Listen to what I say. He was challenging the detractors and the haters, those who are faithful Jews, to hear not just from Peter, but also from the prophet Joel. So he's speaking to where he's speaking their language again, the language even of the detractors. And so often we quote this text without even thinking about what it's really saying to us. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And that's a powerful statement when you really think about it. We hear it, but I'm not sure we're really listening. In a time when it was the men who were expected to be the ones to make the pilgrimage, in a time when women were relegated to, uh, to, to the back of the room in, in worship and the servants were even behind them, uh, the, then Peter is quoting Joel as saying that this Holy Spirit, this powerful wind is blowing across every single person in every single place and they shall prophesy all shall prophesy it's not just 
they, it's not just the people, the, the disciples, it's not just the leaders, it's not just the preachers. It is those who are touched by the Spirit. And that's the Spirit that lands on all of us. If you recall during Lent, um, I, um, I, I, you, I equated the word prophet with the word seer, S-E-E-R. And uh, it's one who sees. So the prophecy is to see, to prophesy, prophesy is to see and then to share what is seen. The power of the Holy Spirit is to open our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts to this new thing that God is doing. It's to look into the darkness into the violence and the harm that is happening right in our midst and to make a bold proclamation that God is here and God is about to do a new thing. It's to stand with Martin Luther King Jr. in the midst of a violent racial strife and say that the arc of the moral universe is long, but who knows the rest of that? Milton does. I was going to say Milton can finish that. It bends toward justice. And he says that in the midst of some of the darkest days. It's to, to, to be able to, to see the beauty that is beyond the mountaintop, that is beyond this, this terrible dark valley that we may be going through, and boldly proclaim that God is leading us there. It's to see the presence of God's kingdom right here in our midst and point it out in every language to every person. And when the Holy Spirit shows us that vision, then the Holy Spirit gives us the tongues to speak. The Holy Spirit becomes the language of hope that is spoken to the hopeless. It's the language of life that is spoken to the dying. It is the language of love that is spoken to those who are both haters and hated. It's the language of peace that is spoken into all the crevices of war that are in every corner of our globe. And it's this Holy Spirit that will empower the apostles to speak and the, the, when they speak truth to power to the Roman Empire, which is really hard. And it's empowering them to speak of a new day, of a new possibility, of a new kingdom, that is greater than the kingdom that oppresses them. And it's the same Holy Spirit that empowers us to speak truth to power and, um, and where we find innocent, lie, innocent people whose lives are upended even by unjust laws. I don't know, maybe even in our own state. Even by injustice that we find in the church, maybe even in the United Methodist Church. It's to bring a powerful message of Jesus that God is here to uh, honor the rich diversity in our world and is that, that is capable of meeting us exactly where we are in the language we speak, whatever that is. And we will move ever closer to the realization of God's kingdom in our midst. When we move from hearing to listening, to deep listening, we might just realize that this inbreaking kingdom of God is not only something that comes from beyond, beyond this earth or that takes us beyond this earth. It's not just about life that's after this life. It's about life right here and now. Because if it wasn't for that, the, um, if, if the apostles believed it only had to do with something beyond, they, had, they wouldn't have spent time organizing and doing what they did. The apocalyptic image of blood and fire and smoky mist and the image of the sun turning to darkness and the moon to blood that will happen for, before the Lord's great and glorious day is not just about life beyond this earth. It is about how God shows up here and moves toward us even when it's dark and even when the, 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 the moon seems like it's bleeding all over us. And this is not a litmus test, finally, for people to be saved. When we hear that phrase, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, what that is is everyone who is capable of seeing God 
will experience the joy of this salvation. But here's the, here's the other part of this. And then the context of all the gospel message, it's God moving toward us. And there are times when we don't yet see it. It's what we call prevenient grace in, in Methodism. Prevenient grace. God moving toward us even when we don't see. And the seeing is the joy of salvation. It's when we get to experience that deep joy. So um, when, we, uh, when we say call upon, it's interesting because the word is uh, epikaleo in Greek, and it has to do with invoking or summoning, calling forth. When we get to that place where in our language we call upon God, when we, when we suddenly find ourselves in a place where we know we need God, it's where God shows up for us. And it's not used to separate those who are saved and those who are damned. That's not what it's about. It's about offering God as, a, as, as that place where when we find ourselves up against a wall, all we have to do is call upon God and that spirit is right here. It's just a breath away. So this is a time for us to experience hope for us to experience um, something bigger. I want to share with you um, in a time of, uh, of disaffiliation in the United Methodist Church, there's one story that kind of rose to the surface some weeks ago, and it's the story of, um, of St. Andrew United Methodist Church in Plano that uh, disaffiliated actually last fall, so it's just St. Andrew, whatever it is, and uh, they, uh, they, they uh, join, they left the United Methodist Church to join, to create along with a church in our own conference, White's Chapel United Methodist Church, to create uh, this um, uh, new uh, thing that is uh, is is the Methodist uh, collegiate. Uh, the it's got the word collegiate in it. I can't remember exactly how it's spoken, but but it's a uh, um, the, the the collegiate Methodist Church is something that is just of these large churches. But in the process of that, the, the leaders of St. Andrew, in their announcement, and it was kind of a surprise to many people who were outside the church, that it had moved in this direction, and that they were gonna be called upon, to, that the church was gonna vote, and the church ended up having enough votes. But in the, in the process of that, what they did was that they kept using the word protection. So uh, when they were talking about uh, that they needed to protect the, the church's clergy, the church's property, the church's finances. And then there is a church in Frisco that was a church that came out of this, this St. Andrew church, and this church is Grace Avenue. Its pastors are Billy and Laura Rickles Ector. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. Rickles Ector. I, make sure I have, didn't have it backwards. And uh, so... Both uh, pastors, Billy and, um, and Laura, spoke to this, 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 what they said about protection. And Laura, in her blog post, uh, was, wrote this incredible response. And what she wrote was, um, the fact is, uh, the, and she has it, quotes what they say first. The fact is we can protect our finances, our property, and our pastors. This statement was uh, made several times by, in, in the meeting at St. Andrew and lifted up again in the recent Dallas Morning News article. Each time the word protect was used, I felt unsettled deep within my soul. I finally discerned why it bothered me so much during the meeting and still today. My deepest belief as the scripture and Jesus constantly call the church and us as disciples to connection, not protection. We are talking about what this spirit does for us. We want to be protected. I get it. It's, it, 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 it's a scary world and what we want to feel is safe. But what we need more in this world is connection. So what this spirit does is about, is makes us truly connectional, which is a big Methodist word. 
And so we are people who uh, are called to move beyond hearing to deep listening. And the Holy Spirit will then use us to create a church where truly all are welcome, all are accepted, all are loved, and all means all. And when we listen deeply to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us and through us, my friends, that is when you will change the world. Amen. the ways that we respond to the Holy Spirit's work in our life and in the world around us is to give of our financial gifts. And at this time, we have an opportunity to do so. And I want to remind you that um, the Spirit is moving so powerfully in in these new church starts in our conference and and beyond. And so um, if you feel so moved to give, um, you can mark on your check or on your envelope, um, new church start, and that will go towards our annual conference to help fund those new congregations that may look very different than what we think church looks like, but that um, are following the leading of the Spirit in various communities. So I invite you to do so. Let's pray. God, thank you for your presence with us and your guidance in our lives, in in the ministry of this church and in the ministry of each of these individual people here as they live as disciples in the world. We pray that as we give today that you will receive our gifts, bless them, multiply them, and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So how about it, church? How do you feel called to respond to the Holy Spirit in your life? How is the Spirit leading you in your daily life with wherever you are, whoever you encounter, um, to, to be the presence of God in the world? Consider that as we sing. So friends, the Spirit comes not to keep us anchored in place here. The Spirit comes to blow us out into the world, to be the church. So go be the church. Go listen to the cries of the world. Speak the language of hope and life in a world of despair and death. And friends, when you speak through the power of the Spirit, the world will be transformed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.